Hello, and welcome to another virtual author event at the Poison Pen Bookstore. I'm John Charles, and the Poison Pen special guest author today is New York Times bestselling author Christina Dodd, whose new book is Point Last Seen. Before we begin, I'd like to let those tuning in know that the Poison Pen was able to secure a limited number of signed hardcover editions of Point Last Seed, and that's special because the regular format is trade paperback. So if you're a Christina Dodd collector, a Christina Dodd fan, or you know someone who is, we have copies while supplies last. Please feel free to give us a call at the Poison Pen or go online. We would be happy to hold one or put one in the mail for you. And now we'd like to welcome back virtually Christina Dodd. Hi, John. How are you doing? I'm lovely. It's always delightful to chat with you. You're such an entertaining person and author. Um, and as we start, I'd like to ask you to kind of go back in time and tell us a little bit about who Christina was before you became a best-selling author. Uh, well, I started at the beginning as a baby, as most people do, but <laughs> what I did as um, a teenager, I, my mother and I were by ourselves, and so I knew I had to get into school and get out of school fast and get a job, and so I became a draftsman, mm -hmm. um, designed roads, mines, and sawmills, and well, I was, I was always a voracious reader. I just read a lot. And eventually, after reading for a while, I thought, this looks easy. I can do this, which is, you know, the stupidest kind of ego there is in the entire world. And that's why it took me two children, three manuscripts, and 10 years to get published. Um, so you were at home writing your first book, and that book turned out, the one that was published turned out to be Candle in the Window. And that launched your writing career? Yes, that's the one. Historical romance. And it won the awards and it's never been out of print. I think yeah, it's I, the first, original print run was like 25,000 and I don't even know. It's probably over 300,000 now. Oh. Um, and eventually you branched out into other subgenres. You did contemporary romance, paranormal romance, romantic suspense. And now you're kind of dipping your toe into suspense with a little bit of romance. Is that how you kind of describe it? I think so, yes. I, I can't imagine doing a book without some kind of emotional relationship going on. Um, but what happens with suspense, of course, is you can take that intense focus off of the couple and, and kind of branch out and give you some marvelous characters. And, and in this case, in Point Last Scene, we're, we're in Gothic, California. It's a small town and everybody's a suspect. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. Tell us a little bit more about Point Last Scene. Point last scene um, I, is, is not the book I meant to write. The original book was <laughs> a book set on the um, cruise lines and, and very closely related to the cruise lines. And I was well into it. And the pandemic arrived and the cruise lines shut off. And I went, I am in real trouble here. And of course, you know, I stomped around and complained and everything and possibly decided I wasn't the one that was in the worst shape during this pandemic. It, it might be you know, like the medical people and the people who were ill. And so um, I settled down and I, I thought, what am I going to write? I just, I don't know what to write. It was just, it wasn't inspiration. It was desperation. And um, I dug out a, a scene that I'd never been able to start a book with that I always loved, which is a, a person a dead person rolls in onto the beach and is revived and either says she's got amnesia or she actually does have amnesia and I just I never could fit it into a story before and I took it off from there and and really went for it and um, the, the thing about writing during a pandemic is that you really get this intense relationship with your characters and with the setting and the story and it was just it, I'm I think it came out really well. I'm very pleased with Point Last Scene. Oh, it's a terrific um, thriller. The Thank you. female protagonist, when she is revived, she can only remember two things, her first name and that she thinks someone was trying to kill her. Well, we know that somebody was trying to kill her because well, she has marks on yeah. the neck. Somebody mm -hmm. choked her. So, yeah. yeah. And, the, and, the, and now it's a question of what's going to happen to her in the small town. And in addition to her story, you've got all these other characters. So there's another kind of danger plot that's colliding with that. And there's, it's just a fascinating um, book for all the layers of storylines in it. 
it was, um, I was basically, you know, you talk about tropes and, and amnesia and the tortured mm -hmm. hero. And what I did was I, I took a bunch of tropes and I kind of shuffled them together like a tarot deck and there, 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 there we were, we had point last scene and, um, it's a, it's a pretty good suspense, I think. As yeah. you, before we started, John said, you surprised me. And, and that was really, I like that because John reads so much. Yes, I mean, it's, I love the book because in one way you have all these different plots and one thread and, I, and I've read a lot. So it shouldn't be a surprise to me that I saw where that was going or at least I suspected, but another one completely took me by surprise. And that's what you love as a reader when the author can kind of yank the rug out from underneath you, metaphorically speaking. But um, you, you see how they did it. It's what Agatha Christie used to do with her mystery. She put the clues there and you felt like an idiot when you realized well, I see, yeah. everything was right there. Um, it's so popular. I mean, people just, she sends you on so many different directions. It's just fascinating to watch her. Um, and the town itself is fascinating. I, I could be wrong, but I thought it was very on trend of you to name it gothic and then the heroine has amnesia which is one of those gothic romance things where they can't remember and gothic is experiencing like a boom in publishing now whether it's romance or suspense or horror there's this whole kind of fascination with that what many of us as readers used to know from the 60s yeah long ago yeah um i think uh in many ways you're kind of to paraphrase that quote, as an author, a mystery wrapped in an enigma surrounded by a riddle or whatever it is, because you write many of your suspense novels, at least, are so intense and so scary and so edge of your seat kind of things. And yet those of us who know you realize you yourself are a reading chicken. Can you kind of explain that dilemma or that dichotomy, I guess, is the correct word? <sighs> You know, life is just funny and you have to ha get that humor into the story because it makes it real. It grounds it in reality. And um, those, all those characters, they just, they're, they're so unique and they're so fascinating. It was, it was, it, they were funny. I mean, you know, I, mm -hmm. the, the uh, Madame Rune is the fortune teller in town. There's a, oh, okay, Gothic is basically, it's got a legend. And the legend is that when the fog comes in, and then goes out again it leaves souls from the dead and um so they've they've been playing got the entire town of gothic has been playing on this legend because it's profitable the businesses like it but at the same time there is a little bit of woo, -woo about the place and so we have a we have a marvelous fortune teller who um has a great shop and, and it actually tells fortunes and it's it's um you know the characters were for so much fun and it's kind of a trendy place too so they have they have a psychic fair during this book and so we have a lot of tourists coming in which really helps with again suspects and then you have kind of like a martha stewart wannabe lifestyle doyenne that's mm -hmm. running the town yep yep she's she was um um i really admire martha stewart and i just enjoyed writing this person that was very much like her um it, it, it was and i and i felt like she was very relatable it, yeah i mean definitely you see different sides to the characters um do you ever scare yourself writing these kind of books oh yeah because they're yes they are suspenseful yes i i yes i have been known to on the really intense scary scenes i've been known to write on and then and i run away and write a different part of the book and then i come back and write a few more pages and then I go back because yeah I, um I'm I'm basically a big old chicken so um I, I've always said I like I like vampires I think they're you know I love all to watch all the movies and I'll read the books and it's because I don't believe in vampires but I do believe in serial killers and so that's you know that to me is just real scary stuff um for those that haven't read your books I do want to add the caveat that I'm not a big fan of gory or graphic or any kinds of things in your books are not like that. Do you deliver I, almost like a Hitchcockian kind of suspense where it's more what your mind is doing to you rather than what's on the page? So they're very good. If readers are not sure about them, I can say definitely you won't find a Stephen King kind of read. They're more 
well, if I could to be Stephen King, I certainly oh, yes. would have managed changes, but no, no, it's not, it's not horror at all. And I don't do the spurting blood stuff. Um, I just, but it, it's scary in its own way. It's, you know, there's a lot to be said for leaving things to the imagination. That's true. Um, how would you as a writer define what are the key elements you need in a good suspense novel? I, you know, wow, John, good question. Um, <laughs> um, you told me to try to stump you, so I, I've been thinking. I did. No, Jane, I did. Jane did. <laughs> Jane Ann Kratz, I'm going to get her. <laughs> um, yeah, no, you, you would just, you have to start with that. It, it isn't an enigma. You have to, to absolutely misdirect people. Uh, uh, but the most important thing you can have is good characters. You want to have, for me, I want a sympathetic, I want simple, sympathetic protagonists. And then, I, and I want, you know, of course, those wonderful villains that are clearly villains. I love to write those because we see those every day. And then, um, the one, the, the hidden villain is this is the scary part, and um, that that they're they're just marvelous to write. And usually, of course, they really are the monsters. Um, they are, but you have a way of writing your villains so that they're three dimensional, or they they're not just cardboard cutouts. Because I think there's some kind of quote that every villain is the hero of his own story. You kind of see that in your villains. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody justifies whatever they do all the time. And, you know, it's your basic, well, she did this. And so I had to kill her. You know, people don't, people don't say, oh, it was my, my choice. Yeah. <laughs> um, another thing that might surprise some readers new to your works is that you, you deliver on the emotion, on the suspense, on all those big kind of dramatic elements, but you also have a pretty wicked sense of humor. Yes. In the writing. Yes. Yes. I, you know, I came by it honestly. My mother was wildly funny and, you know, my husband is pretty fast on his feet. <laughs> and um, I, I, I know my husband's many times read one of my books and he says, that's my line. <laughs> But um, like I said, life is funny. You have to, people are funny. And um, it's a, it, you want to be able to lighten up that heavy, heavy suspense with some, something that will make people, you, you know, what's, what's the saying? Make them laugh, make them cry, make them wait. And that's, that's what's the, the way to go at it. And, and I sincerely believe that. Um, I won't spoil it for readers, but watch for a certain scene. I loved it in the psychics shop. And as you're looking around, there's a little moment where it just, I thought, oh my God, that's so clever. And it's just like two or three sentences in the book. Other writers would maybe just not even invest the time in doing that, but it's there and you just, it just kind of illuminates your real flair. Well. You know, part of my flair is simply that I talk to my readers and they will tell me stuff. They'll offer, they, I say, what name should I name this character? And they come up with great names and, and um, I, I say, what would you, what, what would you name the shops in mm -hmm. the, the small town if you owned one? And they come up with just wonderful stuff. And I'm just like, you, there's, my readers are really smart people. I love them. <laughs> um, speaking of names, Gothic originally had another name. It did. Okay. It was originally, uh, this is one of those things I actually got online and I said, what should I name the small town that has some woo woo aspects? And they gave me a list, you know, they all, everybody named something. And, and so then we voted on it and illusion won. And so I wrote the entire book as illusion. And then I was reading Jane Ann Krentz's series, which is her, her Jane Castle series, which is her futuristic romantic suspense and it's set in illusion town and i went i, I can't do that jane and i share a lot of readers mm -hmm. and uh, i said i just can't do that so i kind of went to the second choice which was gothic and so that then it turned out very well i'm, I'm very pleased with the name yes. um let's talk a little bit about your writing process because many readers are fascinated um with that and um, let me see if i can find your quote you started out, uh, you've said that you started out more learning to plot your books in advance, 
but over the years, the more I knew what I was going to write ahead at the time, the less linear I became. I mean, talk I, about your evolution as a writer and the process. Uh, I, I always do a synopsis first. I'm not a, I, I don't write by the seat of my pants. I always know where I'm going. And, you know, it's not that you don't veer off in different directions, but I generally know what the plot is. I don't usually know who the villain is. I usually change my mind about halfway through on, on the villain. But um, it was book number, like book number 38. And I was writing and there was a lot of angst between the hero and heroine and I didn't feel like writing it. And I was on deadline and it's like, I don't have time to fool around here. So I thought, well, what do I want to write? So I went to like chapter 20. And I wrote about five chapters and then I thought I still don't want to go back and do the angst. And so I just kept going and, and kind of skipping around. And eventually I, I had like the last half of the book and I had, I was able to go back to the beginning, you know, kind of halfway through and, and fill it in the rest of the way I could kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so basically that book was written backwards and um it hit the, hit the new york times nobody's ever said it looks like it's re written backwards people you know it, it doesn't method doesn't matter does it? and i i know a lot of really really successful authors and we all not we don't all write differently but for the most part there's a lot of different different ways of writing and i tell people who want to write if you're getting words on the page then you're doing it right uh, and and there are people who will tell you there's only one way to write and that irritates me a lot don't don't ever believe that there are so many ways to write and if, if you're writing a story and you're it's coming out of you and it's there you're doing it right so as you um, mentioned you've written books that are series though that's not in the world of romance and suspense they're not series in the sense you have to read them in order but they're connected yes. you've written books that have connections as a writer when you decide with a new series like gothic um, you're going to start writing that. How does that affect you? Is there an advantage to writing books that will span several um, titles? Is there a disadvantage? Do you ever write yourself in a corner and have? To oh, yeah, forget what I did before. Oh yeah, I've done that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's an advantage in that you don't have to reinvent the town every time, and all, you know you have the characters set up, and readers get very fond of those characters at the same time when you write a really long series eventually readers are like i i can't i can't invest if it's a 12 book series they 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 get discouraged and, and they don't want to go they don't want to start at the beginning and and go through so the, there's the advantages and disadvantages but um like i said it's 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 great to write a town that i really like and people it with people that i enjoy portraying and and tell their tell you know you like uh, with the minor characters you like to have them have a story too you've got a thread going on and it's so much fun to do that um it, i like i i i like the writing i think it's fun you have to keep a bible so you know who did what and who. you would think i do that john <laughs> yeah i would think but i mean you're not the kind you're more of a daringly is the word writer i it's you know um I, I I had one series where I mentioned characters that I carried into the next series, and at some point I realized I'd changed their last name, and you know which makes readers insane. <laughs> but, but it's it's kind of too late. I, still, yes, a Bible would be a good idea. Um, you've talked about your process of writing for people that might not be familiar; those two or three people out there with your books. Um, how would you describe? It used to be called, I guess now it's called your brand of writing. Well, somebody called me wildly entertaining and wickedly witty. Yes. I think it might have been you. <laughs> I, I I do want to be, I that's what I want. I want readers to really get in there and and feel the emotions and walk in those characters' shoes. And at the same time, I do want them to have a moment where they laugh a little bit and as well as sweat. And um uh, run and 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 fear it's it's important that we nobody wants to actually have the kind of life that i write about it's not very comfortable and but it's wonderful to read about yeah it's escapism um, sure absolutely um i think what's might be surprising to those that aren't familiar with your books and are starting to read them you have written so many different 
kinds of books, but your voice is consistent throughout those books. So if you're reading a Christina Dodd historical romance or you're reading Point Last Scene, that voice is the same. The story may be different, the goals may be different for the characters, but it's your voice that remains consistent. Um, my mother was very proud when I was published, of course, and, and she, um, when I published book number 20, she, this, you know, only my mother would do this, sat down and she started a book one and she read the entire thing book one through 20 and she gave me the most marvelous compliment she said I can see how much your writing has matured as you've continued on and learned so much and at the same time I love your first book best of all oh. and I thought that was very gracious and, and nicely said that is wonderful um as a veteran writer looking back over the world of publishing what do you know now as a writer that you wish you had known when you were first starting out? John, the world has changed so much. I used to be able to answer questions like that. Now I, I don't even know what to say. Um, I really wish there'd been self-publishing when I yeah. started. I mean, like I said, 10 years to get published is a really long time and very discouraging. And, and um, so I, I always tell people they can do it do this better than me if they want to write. They, they don't have to wait 10 years. They could really get, get in there and do it. Um, just just simply, I, I don't think I was stupid about what I did. I just no. always knew that I should keep writing because you're always going to see bad reviews and you're always going to see good reviews and you can't believe any of that. You just have to just keep writing. And, and if you're really moving along, as in right now, we're talking about Pointless Seed, which is going to be published on Tuesday. And then I've already got one book that's finished, completely finished, completely edited and ready to go, which is um, uh, Forget What You Know. And that's going to be out in March. And then I'm already a good ways through the next book. And so that's how you kind of keep your mind up the publishing end of things is to keep writing those stories. And um, it, people escape into my books, but I also escape into my books. Uh, it, it, it's mar it, people, I have a beautiful view here. And people say, how can you write when, it, when you live here, when it's so beautiful? And it's like, well, I'm just going to an entirely different place, which frequently is also beautiful or brutal or whatever. And, and you kind of submerge yourself into that story and write. It's wonderful. Do you kind of treat writing like many writers do is every day you have to do a certain amount or do you write in fits and bursts or? I do try and write every day, but I don't ever try and beat myself up if I don't do it. Life happens. I mean, you oh. know, you got to go on vacation. Your kids get sick. Your parents get sick. Um, you break your arm. Something's going to happen. And yeah. Maybe you're you just can't write that day, and and people will say I've actually heard people say, well, you're not a real writer unless you write every day. Well, no, give me a break. Yeah. This is book number fifty-eight, and there it went. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for the wind to blow it off. <laughs> um, I think you're very right in saying that because, and it goes back to your earlier comments about. For those that want to be writers or are working at writing, you have to find what works for you. And for some people, I know one writer who, like for five days, will basically lock themselves in their room and pour out 80,000 words. And then three or four weeks, you know, they're not doing anything. But that's that's the process that works for her. Yeah, Just, sure. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I, I don't even know how my body would do that. Yeah, it's everyone has to find what works for them. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm a friend of Susan Mallory. She does a really extensive synopsis as an 80 pages. She actually says I, it's a short draft. Um, I'm a friend with, with Jane and Krentz and Susan Elizabeth Phillips. Both of them just kind of write the book and develop it while they're writing. And then there's people like me who, who plot it. And um, it, it's, it's always there. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's fascinating. To, to, when authors get together, they can make your eyes roll in the back of your head because they're so boring talking about their process. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's interesting to readers and to aspiring writers because at some level, level, they are hoping there is that one magic way of doing it but there isn't it's just a magic handshake yeah i know it's just putting the words on the page <laughs> that's i think the first step yeah 
Can you talk a little bit about the importance of editing? Because I think a lot of aspiring writers don't take that into consideration. I edit so much, John. I bet I, I bet I edit as much as I write. Um, and, and not only that, I, I edit every day what I wrote the day before. And then um, before I send it, I read the entire thing and I edit it again. And then I send it to my editor and she edits it and I do it again. And then in, in cases it, now, um, there are sensitivity reads. And um, so again, we do, we do another edit there and then there's the copy edit. By the time I get done with my books, I, I, I'm, I've really rent them enough, trust me on this, but, um, but it also, I, there's a security in there knowing it's been edited so much and I, and I feel like I've nailed the book, quite frankly. Um, let's see, you talked about the writing process. Let's talk a little, about, little bit about you as a reader. You said you were a reader from early on. Um, have you read anything recently that you'd like I, to share? I have. I've been, basically, I, I brought this one in because it's it's Guild Boss. I love the Jane Castle books. I just think they're so much fun. They're futuristic, and the romantic suspense is always great. And I, these are my favorite. I just love them. And there's the Dust Bunnies, of course. Mm -hmm. um, Susan Elizabeth Phillips. Yeah. She. This is the op classic opposites attract. We have an opera singer and a football star going on an ad campaign together, and um, it was and there, you know we have a killer mixed into the whole thing, yeah. and it, it, it was just it was so much fun. And she is she is a marvelously funny writer. She just she she writes she writes she's so more. incredibly talented, and she's one of those writers where in the rare it's the rare instance where I want to say write faster I know her price her process is her process and her process, yeah you, but you just want to say right yeah she's she's also if you know her she's just a force of nature I mean you know she's she's really something and then and I mentioned this one this before Susan Mallory she's my friend but this is the boardwalk bookshop and I think this says everything to everybody who ever wanted to own a bookshop or have anything to do with books and this one's on a boardwalk so we're on the beach oh it was you, it's doing so well and it's so marvelous you everybody should read this one and this one John is the one you recommend which is love, well, love and saffron did you read it yes and and John said it when he recommended it to me, he said it renewed my faith in humanity. And it really is. It's such a wonderful, charming, charming, charming book. Um, one more, one more, just because we were talking about writing and I saw you brought it out. This is the, I don't read writing books. I will go to writing classes. I really enjoy it, but I don't usually enjoy writing books. This one is the one I do. This is the writer's journey and it's based on the Joseph Campbell books and uh he basically he analyzed he was an analyst analyst for uh disney and he analyzed what was working in their movies and then he ended up expanding it into an entire book and this isn't a book that i read straight from one to the place to the other but it's kind of like the bible if i'm having problems i flip it open to any page and it sets me back on the right track he he really explains things well so this is the writing book i recommend Oh, that's, I've heard about it, but not being a writer, I did not know much about it. So that's fascinating to know. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting book. And we have the 25th ed edition there. I actually have two other editions that are in trade paperback. And I finally said, I'm getting the hardcover. You know, I, I have it in multiple positions all around the house. <laughs> so what are you reading, John? Um, well, you mentioned uh, Jane Anne Kranz as her uh, Jane Castle pseudonym. I've just finished her September book, Sweet Water and the Witch, which is another harmony book. Um, you can never go wrong with Jane, whatever name she's writing under. <laughs> it's, um, it's got it all. It's got suspense, danger, a little bit of paranormal stuff going on, dust bunnies. Um, the wonderful thing about that book is we will have signed copies of the Poison Pen. So if you're interested, if you're a Jane and Prince, Jane Castle fan, you'll want to order, uh, reserve one of those now because they're going to go quick, I'm sure. I'm sure. I will make sure I get one. Yeah. It's, I, she's like, like you, Jane is an author who it doesn't matter what she writes, her voice is consistent for me yes. as a reader. 
So I, I like her historicals, I like her contemporaries, I like her futuristics. The voice is what carries me as a reader. Yeah. Um, another book that I would suggest to people this summer is Ruth Ware. I've loved her books. The It Girl is her July release. It just came out a few weeks ago. Um, I was a big Agatha Christie reader when I was younger. I still love her books. I love the movies, love everything Agatha Christie. And you're always searching for the author that writes like that once you've finished them. And there's been a lot of writers that have come and gone over the years. They say, oh, the next Agatha Christie, well, you know, if you loved Christie, read this. And they've never really quite filled that slot for me, but Ruth Ware does. I mean, she's not a knockoff. She does her own thing. But in The It Girl, it's um, a girl goes to Oxford for her college education, meets the fabulous, you know, well-to-do, money, friends, popular. She's her new roommate. They're bond for a year. She's, the roommate is murdered. Um, there you go. And then it seems like they know who did it. Uh, the protagonist actually sees him leaving the room, but after that murderer dies in jail a few years later, it turns out he was not the killer. So um, yeah, now who among her circle of friends was the one that did it? What I love about the book is like Christy, you'll be reading and she'll mention these little things like such and such a character was a pharmacology student and he was doing the thing. Is that clue? Am I supposed to be paying attention? Is this, or is it a red herring? So you get those elements in there and that's there, the ideal. So that was a nice big um, splurge of a read other than point last scene, which is fabulous. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, have you read the JT Ellison, Her Dark Lies? Yes, that was um, very much in Rebecca. the spirit of Rebecca. And I love that too, because Rebecca is one of my favorite, the all time favorite books too. Okay. And it's part of that whole wave of gothics that's been okay. coming and going for the last couple of years. Um, Mexican Gothic, I think was another one that was very much in that spirit. And this year, the big hot book, and we were fortunate at the Poison Pen to have the author virtually was The Hacienda. And I cannot remember the author's name, but it was like, everything that the publisher promised for a debut and more um i then i've i've okay i need to get it i i i heard a recommendation about it and then um then didn't get it so i'll have to do it that's that's the thing that continually amazes me is there people who come into a library bookstore or whatever look around and i can't find anything to read it's like oh my god you know really you know i Going into a bookstore for me is that I find way too much to read. It's walking out with a stack of books and thinking, wow. Yeah, it's like money in the <laughs> it's bank. Not like I, it is. I know. Um, I know. Actually, I saw a cartoon one time and, and with a guy sitting in his library and they said, what are you, are you ever going to die? Are you going to get all these books read? And it's like, no, I can't ever die. And it's the truth. You just like, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of bookstores, one of your early career incarnations was as a bookseller. Um, how do you think that helped you as a writer working? I, um, I was already writing when I went there. I did not tell her I was writing. I, I was very quiet for a very long time about writing. Uh, but I went in and I said, I'll work for free. <laughs> and she knew me. I was a regular customer. And so she kind of went, so I did. I worked for a month for her for free, and then she started paying paying me. And it was you. You really learn how what people like to read, um, and and you learn how to don't make judgments about what people read. If they like to read mystery, that's wonderful. If they like to read romance, that's wonderful. Okay. <laughs> he just glued it down. Um, <laughs> um, and and you learn how to how to you learn what your customers' tastes are and you cater to them. You it, it's really it's really really wonderful. I, I remember one time there was a bunch of women in the store and a man walked in and we were all you know laughing and talking and looking at books and comparing books and everything and and he looked around and I said can I help you sir and he said no I only read literature. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 no. It's, it's, um, I learned a lot about what kind of covers work. I just, it, that was a wonderful experience. I just loved it. That was the job I hated, hated to quit. 
it is fascinating because both in libraries and bookstores, you discover how much a factor chance plays in someone picking up a book. It is about a cover. And we, we don't like to say judge a book by a cover, but readers are. That's what's drawing them to. There are thousands of books published every month. How else can you do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Of course they're picking it up. But then for me, after I pick it up, it's, it's the blurb on the back that matters to me. Yeah. Yeah. You have to grab their attention. And then once you got that, you can kind of hook them with the writing. Um, how much input do you have? Because you have some fabulous covers, some fabulous titles. Do they consult you? Do they just say, Christina doesn't know marketing's going to do what they do best? Yes, there is mostly that right there. This one, um, I it's so striking because of the pink lettering. That's so unusual for a suspense. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm wondering if we're going to see more of that. But we, uh, I have finally said, because they kept putting girls with their back to the camera. And I finally said, you got to stop doing that. <laughs> it's making me crazy. <laughs> it doesn't, and to me, that's just not a way to draw people in. But um, I could be wrong. The next one, forget what you know, does not have anybody on the cover. So maybe that's, maybe I'll, I may find out I was completely wrong. It's trends come and go in publishing, just like in any other place. So it's always interesting and fascinating to watch. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, uh, I'm always glad to get help with the titles because titles are boy titles are tough mm -hmm. yeah it's uh it's a challenge um you've mentioned that there we can we're we can plan as readers for more in the series can you tell us a little bit about what's coming next for gothic um the next in january there's going to be an audio exclusive which will eventually roll over to an ebook which is a short story called welcome to gothic and um i just went kind of crazy and it's a time travel romantic hollywood type tri time travel and uh romance and a suspense and a uh, thriller and it, it in about twenty thousand words uh, it's it's a lot of fun and then uh, in March, it's Forget What You Know, uh, totally different protagonist, but at the same time, it's set in Gothic with the, with the same characters. And um, the heroine is a, is a floral, uh, florist breeder, flower breeder. And mm -hmm. um, basically, the book starts when they are draining a, a reservoir and find a car and bring it up. And there's a body in the front seat, in the driver's seat, and he's been shot in the back of the head but he's the only one in there and he also has a treasure with him and uh the treasure is what sets off the whole the whole plot the whole story oh, sounds fascinating the heroine uh protagonist is um involved in flower hybridization did you say she flat she's a flower breeder. breeder it's a i i was reading a book called flower Con confidential and uh, just fascinating stuff about the flower industry absolutely and um then some one of my readers said you know they, they were a flower breeder and I was like wow this is this is great so that's I went with that and and I did as little with the science as I could because I just don't know enough but uh it, it was but you are a gardener so that kind of you probably drew upon that too well I, I I'm not a very good gardener obviously or <laughs> Washington State, where it's cold all summer long. I seem to remember a bumper crop of lavender one year or something. Oh, there's a bumper crop of lavender every year. Lavender, um, the deer don't eat it, so we planted a lot of plants, and then they propagate, and then we the entire place is covered with lavender right now. Do you want me to move you around so you can see? Um, I would say yes, but since I'm the only person here, if anything goes technologically wrong, we're doomed. So we'll have. Oh, I would be the one that was doing the moving, not you. Oh, okay, sure. Give us a. Hang on. Well, let me see here. All right, let's see. Can you see what we're looking at? Yeah, it looks like flower beds. Oh, it's... there's the lavender. Yeah, there's the lavender, and and we've got. Wait, I'm going to keep walking. Uh, okay, can you see over there? Oh, yeah. That's the stone circle in our garden. And yeah, more lavender. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm really jealous. You have such a beautiful home. Oh, thank you. We do. It, my husband decided he's, he's 
he was a home designer before he retired. So I think we have time for some questions from your many fans out there um, on the different platforms. The first question I can't quite make out the name, but the question is, how do you deal with other authors who are jealous of your TikTok fame? <laughs> for those that don't know what that is, can you explain? Oh, TikTok is the new trendy um, social media, and you do just do quick little, quick little videos and and pop them up there about books. Or um, we live in the middle of the forest. I put up a lot of things like, oh, there's an owl out here now, that kind of thing. Also, um, no, author, no authors don't get jealous. We're all just trying to, you know, my friends are my author friends are really lovely people. I have to tell you this: they're uh, authors are pretty. I've known a few stinkers, but mostly they're really great people. Um, and so nobody, no, no, people are jealous. That's it's, uh, and TikTok is very interesting. It's um, very young. It does, yeah, it's definitely skewing towards a younger readership. Um, have you thought about expanding to book talk? Uh, it is, uh, TikTok, all you have to do is add the the hashtag book talk mm -hmm. and so yeah if people want to find me they can you know obviously search for my name or they can they can hit that book talk and it, as soon as you hit that hashtag you'll get there i mean you'll get so much material probably just search for my name first <laughs> i the i just popped things, uh, something up right before you we came on because uh -huh my husband and my daughter were were um power washing the steps and what they did was they because the steps were really dirty so what they did was power wash in point last scene oh. <laughs> and the date of release which is six or seven twenty six, and it, which made me laugh that was very funny very sweet oh. um another question from a reader is have you ever thought about going back to historical romance no um I feel like, I think I did 29 historical romances. I feel like I, I wrote myself out with them. Um, I never say never, but but no, probably not. Um, I still, when I write, when I write books, I like to, I like those dual stories where you're going back into the past and there's a history that's influencing the future. And I, that to me is, is you can see the combination of the two different genres for me with the suspense and the, and the, history. Fascinating. This is actually an interesting question. Someone writes in, if you could write any book other than those that you yourself have written, what book would you choose? Jane Eyre. Oh. <laughs> um, there's, there's, that's too hard. There's too many. Um, the Nightingale. Um, there's, just you're just talking so much i would love to write something that is del as delightful as as this i just think this kind of thing is so so great yeah it's um it's well that goes back again to the author and their own voice it's not a book you could write because you're not charming in that way unfortunately <laughs> you, have, you have a lot of skills christina but uh, heartwarming is not one of them that i'd apply to your books um but yeah. it, well, it, there's a lot to be said for books that just make people happy and and i know i don't do heartwarming warming, but you what the great thing that people really don't talk about very often in this job is you actually do get letters and emails with people saying the most touching wonderful thing about your books because everybody has their problems and if they get distracted at the right time you you really do take them away from their troubles and that's that's a great gift and yeah kind of a privilege to know too Another person has written in, are you a big movie fan? And if so, what are your three favorite movies? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a flip-flop movie fan. I'm a, um, I love The Fugitive. The uh, Wrong Alibi was kind of based on The Fugitive with, with um, Harrison Ford. I kept trying and trying to make that that plot work into a story, and I finally managed it. And and wrong, wrong alibi worked very well with that plot. Um, probably my favorite movie all all time is The Sound of Music. 
really? Well, I guess. And then, of course, um, The Martian is, is, I just think it's oh. a wonderful movie. I thought it was a wonderful book, and I thought it was a wonderful movie. Mm -hmm. And um, when I'm feeling discouraged, I really like to watch The Martian because it's just such a triumph of, of you know, human the human against uh, nature type story. It's, 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 I enjoy it. Plus, there's Matt Damon. Well, there you go. Um, another person wants to know how did you keep yourself occupied during the pandemic other than writing? A lot of gardening and um, a lot of trying to ignore the news. <laughs> oh. But um, yeah, we, 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 my husband and I were, were up in the woods and we were alone. And um, so there was a lot of uh, discovering that you really shouldn't be together 24 seven if you're married. And um, we, we, so that was that was difficult but um you know basically we just survived and kept putting one foot in front of another and i think like everybody else in the universe that survived went through the that year we're changed we're different people and i also feel like we have it's 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 like watching a um um uh, rocket launch in a group or um um, seeing a, a disaster in, in a group, it unites you in ways that will never go away. All yeah. of us who lived through the pandemic understood what happened and uh, we're united there. This next one is a bit confusing, but the question is, is it true you can attribute much of the success of your books to a canine co-author? <laughs> Uh, my husband and I raised a um, uh, dog for canine companions for independence uh, as, a, as an assistance dog. And um, we, we sent him away to college to become an assistant and for a handicapped person. And uh, he flunked out. So when he came back, <laughs> we, I, he, he was very helpful for me. Those dogs are really just lovely, lovely dogs. And um, he would, when I went, when I had a book out, he, he'd pose with, you know, headphones on and I say he's listening to the book. And, and um, I, at one point I wrote an article and said, well, he wrote a book called Jane Airedale. And uh, so, so yeah, he, he, Ritter was a lovely dog. Another person wants to know how much input do you have into the audio versions of your books? Um, they let me pick out the the narrator. Uh, usually, they give me several choices, and then I and then I can pick it out. The narrators are, you know, they're, they're voice talents. They they're actors and actresses, and they're just they're so amazing with what they can do with these stories and the characters. I'm totally amazed, uh, admiring of what they do. Someone else wants to know if we like reading your books, can you suggest another author similar? Well, Jane Ann Krantz. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, 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 yeah, um, I, who else, John? Oh, probably Alison Brennan might be another good choice. Oh, yeah, she's very good. Um, Lisa Gardner, maybe, depending yeah. on the book, yeah. Uh, I think if you're talking suspense, those would be the ones I'd think of first. Yeah, uh -huh. I have trouble comparing my voice to anybody else. I don't. Yeah, it's, it's not something I can do. I can do. Yeah, you're not going to. You're not ever going to find another author who writes. That's what drives me crazy, and I internally fume when this comes out. When someone asks me in a library, when I worked in a library or in a bookstore, I don't say anything. I'm just on the inside screaming i want a book exactly like yes like, no there's no book exactly like another even the same author may not write the same book you no. can find books that are similar in tone or similar um in plot line or all those things but if you're looking for a book exactly like another author it's going to be a lifelong search in futility exactly no it just it, it it never does i had one of my customers when i worked in the bookstore came in and she said all i want to do is feel like i did the first time i read kathleen lewis oh. and I was like, that that says it very well about what people want to read and why they want to read it it's that yeah. feeling that they're looking for um but you you just have to keep reading and you know, you're going to find different stuff that you really like 
Yeah, it's definitely a testament to the power of a book with a reader and you want them to find something similar. It's just as a reader yourself, you have to be willing to be open to a little bit of a difference in things. You can't. But one of the things, uh, other things is, is that you really, readers really like certain tropes. I mean, I have several amnesia books because I just love reading them and I love writing them. I just feel like you have somebody who looks in the mirror and says, who is this person? Are you, and looks at other people and says, are you the one that tried to kill me? And then they look in the mirror again and think, am I a murderer? They know nothing about themselves. And so to me, it's, it, it, the amnesia trope is absolutely one I love. I love the tortured hero. And I I think people, when you're kind of trying to direct people or when they're reading back copy, that's what they're looking for is what do I really, what's, which, which story do I really like? And that what's, that's what makes people try new new authors besides recommendations from experienced booksellers because the booksellers really can they know what you like and they can read what you you know and, and you go back in and you give them more feedback and they, they eventually really zero in on what you're going to enjoy i think that's very perceptive of you to um, say that it's kind of and you see that kind of reflected also in publishing when one book becomes popular i'm thinking of lucy foley when she hit the bestseller list and that was a group of people trapped in an isolated location with the killer which is not exactly a new idea it goes all the way back to and then there were none but all of a sudden that seems to be like the thing to write in suspense and it there are some really good books that have taken that trope as you call it and created really entertaining books but i think readers are trying to capture that same experience and somehow that trope does it yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a very clever one and it'll wear out eventually, but it'll come back in 30 years. You'll see it come back, come around again. Oh so. yeah, it's like uh, the whole boom in romantic comedies and contemporary romance. People are like, you know, this is such an exciting, fresh new thing. I'm thinking, really? Think back to 1999, you know, with Bridget Jones's diary and the first boom in chiclets. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a, it, it, I, the book industry is just endlessly fascinating to me. I, I, I'm always interested to see what people think about it and, and um, hear, hear people's reviews on the books. Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. And lest we think we know too much, there were people that predicted 20 years ago, the printed book would go the way of the dodo and it's still doing quite well. Yes, it is. And bookstores are doing very well. I was reading about the revival of bookstores that occurred during the pandemic because people were reading so incredibly much and that was a great thing. Yeah. Uh, another question from someone is, how hard was it to transition from historical romance to suspense? Um, it was challenging, but one of the reasons I've changed my genres is because after you've, I've been published for 32 years, after you've been published for 32 years, you are afraid of getting stale. Certainly I was afraid of getting stale and I like challenges. And so that's that's exactly what I was doing. Um, when it comes to historical romance and contemporary suspense, when I was trying to get published, my first book was a historical romance. My second one was a contemporary suspense. And then my third one was Candle in the Window, which was a medieval historical romance. And that's the one that got published. But I was always zipping back and forth between them anyway, because that's what I read. I, I, I actually read probably everything except mystery. And, um, so it was it was challenging and I like the challenge and that's why I keep doing ridiculous things like changing genres which makes readers insane you know the, the, <laughs> and I, then I moved to paranormal and then, now I'm in suspense and, and uh, so they don't know quite how to put well on the plus side at least you haven't changed your name three times like certain other authors we could mention we could mention that's exactly right no I haven't well you're not even coming up with all of her names. She's. <laughs> oh, I know. If you go far enough back, there were more than three. But yeah, um, but I that's I think that that's a dilemma for authors, and I can understand on the one hand when you want to significantly change what you're writing, why you might want to go with a pseudonym or a different name, because there are some readers who may not look at the back of the book or the jacket copy, or they'll just pick it up on the name and thinking, wait a minute, why is this person doing suspense? I wanted. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So yes, no, I can certainly see changing your name, but I I haven't done it. So I, I will I'll probably continue to chug on like this. Another question is you've written so many different types of genres. 
are you hoping to write something that you haven't, I guess, are you hoping to write in a genre that you haven't tried before? I have a fabulous idea for a YA um, oh. mystery like a Nancy Drew in, in medieval times, but um, I'm trying to refrain. <laughs> Well, you had me up until medieval times, and I was like, really? Okay. Um, I, I, the problem with, right, people will say, I have a really good idea for a, for a book. I, you should write it. And it's like, I have so many ideas for books. I don't need more ideas for books. What I need is the time to write, to write them all. So. Do you keep your, your potential ideas like in a file somewhere? Or? It's just, plotting is, you know, that's really the fun part of, of it. And if you can get together with, 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 when we have, when those of us who know each other have plot problems, we tend to get on the phone and talk to each other or, or Zoom or something like that. And you can really get, um, having different brains if you've got a problem while you're writing really helps. And so uh, it's a plot group and you, and you sit there and plot books for each other. And that's a lot of fun too. Um, before we run out of time, which is rapidly approaching, how can readers learn more about your books and you? Do you have a website? Do you have a newsletter? I do have a website. It is, wait, christinadodd.com. And please sign up for my newsletter. It's, I, you know, I'm a writer. I do, do a good newsletter. I frequently have readers tell me they like my newsletters as well as they like my books. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and you, you can find out all the information there. We keep it very up to date. That's great. And TikTok. And TikTok, absolutely. I'm on Facebook, of course, and Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff. But yes, TikTok's really the kind of the thing that's, that's coming along. Well, it's been just a thrilling uh, hour with Christina Dodd, whose new book is Point Last Seen. Before we leave uh, you tuning in, I do want to let you know we do still have a few copies left. So if your summer wish is to have a signed hardcover edition of Point Last Seen, hurry, order now, go online, give us a call. We'll be happy to hold them aside. It's the feel-good summer beach read of the year. <laughs> yes, and, and it makes a great gift. So oh, that's true. Think of Christmas. Yeah. Yes, exactly right. Before, before Thank you so much, John. It's always a pleasure to visit with you and, oh. and Ruben Penn. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. We're looking forward to your next book. And thank everyone who's been tuning in. Thank everybody. We hope to see you another for another virtual author event or in person at the Poison Pen Bookstore. Absolutely. It's a great bookstore. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them and your help would be appreciated, please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.